At this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you a new publication, the pocket-sized book of 192 pages, entitled True Peace and Security from What Source? This book discusses the big questions that are in the minds of the people everywhere today. And it's done in a manner that can be readily understood. It would be very beneficial for all of us to read it carefully, also to use it from house to house, and on our Bible studies in the homes of people who are interested in the kingdom of the heavens. It realistically considers the matter of peace and security in one's own life, also in the lives of all those people who are seeking goodwill of Jehovah God. It certainly will aid the people to see the great issue that faces all intelligent creation and to appreciate what is required of them in order to stand clean before Jehovah God. Immediately, Immediately after this meeting is dismissed, you'll be able to get a copy from the ushers on a contribution of 25 cents. There are extra copies here, so some of you can take another one. As for the pioneers, you'll be able to go to the book room and show your pioneer convention identification meal ticket and get one copy free. Tomorrow, if there are still extra copies, you may get them at the book room and take them home with you. It would help us greatly in the distribution now if just one member of each family would get all the copies required for the other members of the family for their own personal reading at this time. More information will be provided later as to how this book will be used in our field ministry. It will be a fine publication to aid honest-hearted persons to see how True peace and security can be obtained. May Jehovah bless all of you as you read this book and then distribute it to others to help them to stand approved before the Son of Man when Jehovah's day of victory arrives. Brothers, Jehovah's people thrill to the experiences of our brothers in other lands. We might at this time talk to some of the missionaries from South America. We'd like to introduce to you Brother Jack Butler and his wife Jane. Where do you serve as missionaries and how long have you been there? For the past 21 and a half years we've been serving in the field of Peru, South America. Okay. Since you've arrived at your assignment, what progress have you seen? Well, when we first got to Peru in 1952, we were able to find five congregations operating in the country with just a little over 150 publishers. Now, just before coming to the assembly, the branch overseer explained to me that we had just reached a new peak of publishers of 7,029. And there are now 128 congregations in the country. Sister Butler? Could you tell us the attitude of the people since the 1968 Ecumenical Council? The Catholic Church has been removing the idols from their churches, and the people can't seem to understand why. And it gives us a wonderful opportunity for a sermon about images. Another thing that has affected uh, the attitude of the people is the reaction of certain Catholic priests to the uh, celibate marriage arrangement of the Catholic Church. Not being satisfied with it, they have opted in quitting the priesthood and becoming married. And this has caused a lot of comment among the people, giving us an opportunity of giving a good sermon about setting proper examples as married men. When we got to Peru in 1952, the attitude of the people was that the Bible reading was uh, prohibited. Very few people had the Bible in their homes. 
Now the government has, as part of their cultural and educational program, requiring that Bible reading be done in the schools. So that has given us a great opportunity in placing more Bibles to these people. Do you ever have to help educate people? Yes, in the outlying sections, especially in the provincial towns, there is a high rate of illiteracy. So the society's program of teaching the people to read and write has come in very handy. Uh, just recently, I was able to teach one person of good uh, attitude toward the truth how to read in just six months. And uh, that's studying one hour a week. And just before coming, she received her first Bible. She looked up and read for herself her first scripture. It was a heartwarming experience. Have you found a good aid to help these people down there? Yes, we found that the great teacher book is a great aid to help these people. It has uh, aided the undereducated ones, and because of its simplicity, they were able to understand it better. I had one Bible study for just reading the great teacher book uh, destroyed all of her images. Since the country is under military rule, how does the draft affect the brothers? Well, up to the present time, the brothers have been affected in different ways, only in a personal way. The persecution hasn't been organizational-wide. But just about a month ago, two special pioneer brothers received exemption from military service on the basis of being ministers. And we hope this precedent will be followed throughout the entire country. Thank you, brother and sister brother. This is Brother Harvey Conroe and his wife, Anne. You are also from Peru. How long have you been serving there? Well, we've been working in the northern part of Peru now for 23 years. Have you shared in the progress of the work? Uh, we've had the privilege of being assigned to six different cities in the north of Peru. In those six cities, we helped two congregations and established four more. Before you began your missionary activity, how long had you shared in the full-time ministry? We pioneered in Alabama, Florida, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Missouri for 17 years before we went to Gillette. Well, what effect has the full-time ministry had on your raising a family? Well, I guess we've done pretty well. We are up to a granddaughter. How is it that missionaries can have a granddaughter? Well, when we started in the pioneer work, we had two sons. The youngest one was a baby in arms. And uh, we all four went to Gilead together when this youngest child was 16. I think he was one of the younger ones to get a diploma from Gilead. And uh, in Peru, both boys married missionaries. And uh, our oldest son worked for eight years as a missionary before he had to return to the States for health problems. And uh, our youngest son is still there. He raised a daughter, and uh, she's now a special pioneer. She married a special pioneer recently. And uh, this boy is the district overseer now in Peru. Isn't that a wonderful family record of Jehovah's service? Thank you. Brother Jerry Schneider serves in La Paz, Bolivia. How long have you been in the full-time ministry, Brother Schneider? Well, from about 15 to 16 years. Okay. In seven of those years, I've been serving in La Paz, Bolivia. What is your territory, Brother Schneider? Well, most missionaries, of course, are encouraged to work in the uh, city, in city territory. Of course, sometimes we make trips into the jungle area. Well, why do you go into the jungle, Brother Snyder? Well, to do the same thing you do in the city is uh, Matthew twenty-four fourteen says, this good news of the kingdom must be preached. So we uh, go into the jungle and preach to the larger populated areas. Do you go by yourself? Well, generally, we try to train the Bolivians to... Uh, take up this kind of work because generally they have uh, knowledge of the language. 
So this helps then in contacting the people in the jungle area? Yes. What do you mean when you say jungle area? Well, um, take for instance La Paz, it lays at 13,000 feet. Well, 11,000 feet, the alto is 13,000 feet. But then you go down into the jungle or um, vegetation, uh, and it's what we call jungle. Of course, uh, La Paz, or the lake up in this area, is the headwaters, you might say, of the Amazon River. And then you, as you go down, you get into heavier vegetation. Okay. How do you travel in these areas, Mr. Snyder? Well, generally, there's a truck to the end of the line, and then from there you either go by foot or you can take a boat. For example, one trip we made uh, not too long ago was four days in by foot. And then not too long ago, well, it's been several years ago now, that uh, I made a trip into a place, took 22 days by boat. Well, what were some of the experiences that you found on this boat trip? Well, the people really accept the truth there. They're really curious as to who we are. For example, um, the people here uh, don't know who we are, so they come out to the boat to receive us. And the ones that uh, doesn't know the boat's in, they ring a school bell or some bell to call the people together for important meetings. And so then we give a talk. What uh, kind of results did you have as far as publications on this trip? Well, we placed over 2,000 magazines and then 500 books. Well, during your trip, isn't it uh, rather dangerous to be out in the jungle, in the Amazon River? What are some of the problems? Well, naturally, there's snakes and there's tigers and there's crocodiles and things on the Amazon River like that. And, of course, you have to watch out for those. But, uh, and they say that there is uh, savages in the jungle area. Of course, the society recommends that we don't go into the deep jungle like that because, uh, well, it's uh, unfruitful. So we work around the fringes, you might say. There's been one incident, for example, uh, I think this uh, was on the border of Bolivia, it said that uh, seven of uh, uh, Babylon's missionaries went into this area and never came out. They just so disappeared. They just disappeared. So we can see the dangers that exist, but how productive is the work in the jungle area? Well, in one place that I know of, we made trips down there, there is two congregations now in several groups. So the people are really accepting the work in, in these areas, even though they have, do have a problem of, problem of illiteracy. Are you all able to help them in this way then? Yes, what? In the illiteracy problem. Yes, we, of course, through the society's uh, aids, the learn to read and write, uh, we help the Bolivians in the literacy problem. And, of course, here lately the government has been doing this quite extensive. Most of the Bolivians now, they're sending down into these uh, Bolivian, these jungle areas. And so now we have more work to do to go down there. Uh, and generally they don't have uh, uh, books or Bibles or anything, so we have to uh, help them in as far as that is concerned. Okay, thank you very much, Brother Snyder. During his 39 years of active service to Jehovah, our first speaker this afternoon, Brother H.D. Wetzel, a circuit overseer in the Dallas area, has spent many days and nights making disciples. It's quite appropriate, therefore, that he address this convention on the topic, Working Day and Night to Make Disciples, Brother Wetzler. Dear brothers, are we willing to work day and night in making disciples? You've answered that question. 
As we think of the answer in our own mind, let's remember something about the Apostle Paul. It's going to help us continue thinking this way. Think, if you will, how the Apostle Paul and those who worked so well with him worked very, very hard in making disciples in their day. Those newly interested people that they dealt with became dearly beloved to those brothers of ours back there. Paul and his companions were deeply concerned, and they showed this concern even for the very lives of those that they preached and who received the teaching. How do we know this? Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. So, having a tender affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the good news of God, but also our own souls. Now why? Because you became beloved to us. Then Paul goes on to say, Certainly you bear in mind, brothers, our labor and toil. It was with working night and day, so as not to put an expensive burden upon any one of you that we preach the good news of God to you. Now, did you note that point? Paul and his companions were so moved that they imparted not only the good news, but their own souls in behalf of those dearly beloved ones. We are certainly motivated to give of ourselves night and day in making disciples. Now think again of this point about Paul. He worked very hard to care for his needs so that he would not be a burden to them. He wanted to serve in that area so that no one would have to feel that Paul became a burden to them. Do you remember something about Paul's schedule? It went something like this. Check this against our schedule today. Not that we're going by some rigid thing, but our daily life. From about sunrise to 11 a.m., Paul made tents. From about 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., he preached. From 4 p.m. to midnight, he was making house calls on his brothers. Now do you see why we say that Paul worked night and day in making disciples? We want to imitate Paul as we can. Here's a serious question then for you and for me. Is our concern for the sheep-like ones in our day that strong? Most of you have to work for a living, like Paul. Many of you care for a family. You younger ones are still going to school. And yet, in addition to all this, you share in the ministry. But how concerned are we about the interested ones we find as we preach and teach? Do we truly have a tender affection for them, like Paul? Now here's a danger. If we think largely in terms of our own ministry, we probably would put in many hours in service, we would rejoice in the placements that we make of literature, and we might even make some return visits, because we know we should. But how often it could be that months would go by and we didn't make a return visit on these interested ones. Would that be showing concern like Paul? Question, how can we become even more concerned for these sheep-like ones? Answer, we must have the same concern for these dear ones that the Apostle Paul and his companions had. You see, if we have this concern, plans to help them just fill our minds. Well, what plans? Well, for example, I could ask myself when I find an interested person, how can I get back quickly to see that person? I can ask myself this question. 
Could I call them by phone if I'm not able to see them again at their home? We know the devil is going to stop interested persons if he could. We wouldn't want it to be our fault, would we? We remember then that Jesus said, our commission is to preach and teach, but he said, go therefore and make disciples of people of all the nations. So brothers, this part of our work certainly deserves our very serious attention, doesn't it? If we're going to work night and day in making disciples. You remember this point too as we think about Jesus and the work that we're doing today. He said, the harvest is great, the workers are few. Well, how many of you brothers really think that there's enough work for us to do to keep us busy night and day? You're right. Much interest has been found in recent years. In fact, over 600,000 were baptized in just five years. It made us happy to hear that 1,628 were baptized today. But let's think past that now. 250 million books, booklets, magazines, and subscriptions were placed worldwide. Most of you had a share in this. But many of these people who took literature will yet become disciples. But think of this interesting point now. How many others did not take literature? And yet they still might be interested. Now how can we tell? They make appreciative comments. Well, what comments? Haven't you heard many comment how concerned they are over unrighteous world conditions? Brothers, this attitude on their part opens up the way to give them help. Now, who are some of these people that make these comments? Sometimes we find this response when we talk to our fellow workers. Some of you younger ones in school have talked to your classmates. In fact, we'd like you to raise your hand if you've ever had the opportunity to talk to someone in school. How many of you have done that, you boys and girls? Look at that. You've heard some of your friends say how concerned they are. Well, here's some interested people that we want to help. You older ones at work, you've heard your workmates make comments how concerned they are. These people need help. We're concerned for them, just like Paul was concerned. So there's a need to follow through then on all the interest that is shown. And this is what we want to talk about now. How can we follow through on this interest shown? Why, it's obvious, isn't it? By working night and day to make disciples. Take, for instance, this situation. Have you talked to a housewife and begun a study with her? What about her husband? Have you asked him to study yet? Let's talk to Brother Chuck Gentle of Dallas and see why you should. Brother Gentle, how did you become one of Jehovah's Witnesses? My wife's brother uh, was a, is a witness, and he convinced my wife to have a study. So she learned the truth and began to go to the meetings, taking along with her our six children. But how did you begin to study? Well, my oldest boy, 15, uh, he didn't want to have a study or go to the meetings. But she talked to one of the elders, and he said that he'd have a study with him. So when he came to the house to, for the first study, well, he asked if I'd care to sit in on it. What convinced you to sit in, though? He said as head of the family, it would be good for me to know what they were learning. And, and so I, I did uh, sit in, and now I'm one. Well, uh, do you feel that you would have studied if you weren't asked? No, I doubt it. I was busy earning a living, and I was ever thankful I did, though. Thank you, Brother Gentle. Do you see then how important it is to offer to study with the man of the house? Why should we produce a divided family when the wife is studying and perhaps the children and leave the man out? Now, here's one of our brothers because someone showed concern for him. Let's talk now 
to Sister Marilyn Price. This is another example. Have you placed a book recently with someone, say the truth book? Have you offered to study with that person yet? Well, Sister Price, how did you first begin to study with the witnesses? I was taking the Watchtower and the Awake from a lady from time to time, but I never read them. Then I had so many personal problems come up in my life, and I started praying to God, but I found no comfort. Then after a particular bad time, I told God that I was going to end up in the insane asylum if I couldn't find him and that I needed help. Did he give you that help? At 8.30 in the morning, the lady that was selling me these magazines came to the door. It was very cold and drizzly, and I invited her in. She then pulled out the truth book and started talking about it. Had you seen it before? I explained to her that my children had taken the book several months earlier, but that I had not looked at it. She then told me about the free home Bible study that went along with the book. She asked me if I thought I might be interested in something like that. And that was 8.30 in the morning, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. How did your study progress? <laughs> well, we sat down right then and went through the first chapter. And from then on, we never missed a week of studying. As I got to know the witness better, I told her about my problems. And she gave me many scriptures that were of great comfort to me, plus some scriptures to help me live with them day to day. Well, would you have studied if this sister hadn't offered you the study? Well, I would not have known of the Bible study program, and my problems had so burdened me down that I think if she hadn't come that cold, drizzly morning that I would have just given up. Sister Price is now a pioneer herself. So do you see what can happen if we offer to study with those who take literature? Thanks, Sister Price. You see, someone was concerned for her. We see then how genuine interest, brothers, on our part should move us to follow up this interest on these sheep-like ones that we find in our territory. When we do find this interest, we don't just put it down on the house-to-house -house record and then file it away in the book bag, do we? These people need help like Sister Price needed help. And doesn't Proverbs 3.27 remind us, Do not hold back good from those to whom it is owing when it happens to be in the power of your hand to do it. We have something in our hand, brothers, and we want to do good with it. This is the truth, and these people need the truth and we're concerned for them. Now, isn't it evident that if interested persons are to be spared through the coming Great Tribulation, they need more than literature. They must have the mark. And we've learned that that mark, among other things, is the Christian personality that identifies one as a true follower of Christ Jesus. And it takes time to learn the truth, doesn't it? It takes time to put on that new personality. All right, we agree with that. Now suppose, though, there's genuine interest that you note, but you're, you don't think that you could get back to help that person. Personally, you are, aren't able to make the return visit. What do you do? Ask another publisher for help. Now this is a question, uh, don't applaud or raise your hand or anything, but just answer it in your own mind. How many of you would be willing to help out if someone found interest. All right, think about that. Now, what else can we do? If we need help to aid this interested person, ask your study conductor or your Bible study overseer. These brothers are well qualified to give us help. We want to feel the urgency of this matter, brothers, if we're going to continue showing concern for those interested ones in our day. Let's consider now the importance of adapting to the needs of the interested ones. It's vital that we all be flexible and discerning in starting and conducting studies. Now, why do we say this? Because some people are interested in the Bible, they will accept a direct offer of a Bible study. 
but others have some doubts about the Bible. This is because of what they've been taught. They may not accept a study right off, and yet you sense interest. Now, what do we do? You may need to cover material from the evolution book or the Word of God book. Well, how do you cover that information? We can't study with them. Perhaps read and discuss some of the points in the book. Take it a section at a time. Some people are or skeptical of all religions, and so they just uh, shy away from anyone talking Bible to them. What do we do with this type of person? Well, this person needs repeated friendly calls. Answer any questions they might have, and then in time they may study as they become acquainted with us and as they gain confidence in us. But never lose sight of the objective, and that is to start that Bible study. Some people can be reached because of their interest in their family, like Brother Gentle. We could show this person how to use the great teacher book in studying with his own children. And then in time, we can invite all members of the family to join in a family study. Certainly, this new pocket-sized book that we received this morning is going to be a great help to this, brothers. True Peace and Security from What Source? Now, the very title is intriguing, isn't it? What are some of the chapters that might interest us? Have you noticed chapter 2? Can men bring lasting peace and security? That question is on people's mind. Did you notice chapter 3? Are the world's religions giving the right lead? Look at chapter 7. When will the foretold world destruction come? Chapter 12. Respect for authority essential for peaceful living. And look at 13. Your view of sex. What difference does it make? And this one, 15, why care what happens to other people? You see how this book is getting into principles. Now, this book is designed for home Bible study, but it's not necessarily the one that we would use on every study. Be flexible. And then when interested ones are ready for dedication, before they get baptized, it would be well for them to have personally read the truth book and this new book. And then they see not only doctrine, but principles of Christian living. Sometimes the adapting needed is when and where we study. Now, what do we mean by this? Well, for one thing, we need to show persistence in finding the interested one home. How many times we make those return visits? They're not home. So many people are out when we call that we need to get a suitable time to get them home. What do we do? We may need to use some odd hours if they're willing to study. Now why? Because we're concerned for them. What about noontime, say on the job? Or what about very early mornings like Sister Price's teacher? Or what about inviting these people to come to our home if they couldn't study in their home? To show what we mean, let's talk to two sisters who have started studies in just these ways. Now, note, brothers, the persistence shown in finding the person home because of concern, and note, too, the odd hours willing to spend in studying with this interested person. Now, we're going to talk to Sister Dijong first. She's a pioneer. And she was willing to study with a young woman even on her lunchtime. Now, you might not think that's so odd, but Sister DeJong, tell us uh, about your study. Uh, this study is with a young girl who works in Plano, Texas. She takes her lunch break twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays to study with me. But why do you study on the lunch break? She works so late at night, there really isn't any other time available, Brother Winston. Why couldn't you study with her in her own home, though, on weekends? She lives so far away, really not even in our territory, and she's so new yet until I felt it wasn't advisable to turn her over to someone else yet. So you're willing really to spend your lunch time at least twice a week to study with her? Yes, and she's really making good progress. She attends all the meetings, and she's here at this assembly. 
Do you uh, recommend others then arranging to study with interested ones at uh, odd hours? I certainly do. Because of doing so, many blessings have come to me. Thank you, Sister DeJong. <laughs> Sister Clark has been a temporary pioneer. She has an interesting set of circumstances to show us why we need persistence in calling back on those who show interest. Sister Clark, tell us what happened. While pioneering in April, I met a young woman who showed much interest in the article, Resurrection from Hell Will Benefit All Those. Uh, she showed much interest in this article, so as our discussion continued, I offered her the truth book, which she had had and had read it through. Then I offered her the study, which she accepted, and a time was set up. Well, how did the study progress? Well, when I called back, I found she wasn't home. I was really disappointed because I felt she was really sincere. So you just gave up then? No. About a week later, I called back again, but still no answer. Now you quit. Oh, no. I left my phone number on a folder in her door. She called you then? No, I didn't hear from her. So towards the end of the month, I decided I would call back once more before I marked her off. What happened? Well, I not only found her home, but I started the study. Would you advise others then to be that persistent in helping newly interested ones? Yes, I would, because if we aren't, who will help them? Thank you very much, Sister Clark. After considering, then, all these thoughts, friends, let's ask ourselves this question. What will I do in this work of disciple-making? What any of us can do, of course, depends on our own limitations, our circumstances, for instance, family responsibility, perhaps uh, poor health. But, brothers, what is our desire? That's really what it means, our desire, our concern for these new ones. The work we do in making disciples isn't done in our own strength. We know that. It depends on Jehovah. We must pray then for his direction, and he certainly will use us in this disciple-making work. So whatever our personal abilities might be, let's make ourselves available. Now, the Bible study work isn't just for those who uh, might have a great deal of educational background. Suppose some of us feel that we lack the needed education to uh, conduct a Bible study, and perhaps we're thinking of holding back. What should we do? We want to remember, then, that others have had unusual success in this work despite their limited educational background. What is important to success is that we have a genuine interest in these people. We know a little sister in a different circuit. She's uh, just a little person about this high. She has a strong accent. But when she goes up to the door and that person comes, this sister just beams. And she says, I like it to tell you about it, the kingdom. And that householder is just warmed up. And you wouldn't think that uh, this little person could make uh, uh, much success in dealing with people, but she has such warmth and such zeal and such concern for these people, they just warm up to her, and she's very successful in disciple-making. What about you friends who are getting up in years? Older brothers and sisters, infirm ones are conducting studies. How? Remember the pictures that the circuit overseer shows now? Remember the pictures of some who use the telephone? Someone sits home typing letters? Those are all ways that a person incapacitated could share in disciple-making because they're concerned. Some invite interested people to their own home. Many of the younger ones, too, help people their own age. Now, as we sum up what we've talked about and we think about this matter of disciple-making, Think of this. There are blessings for those who exert themselves. Our work isn't in vain, regardless of the response. Paul said at 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Consequently, my beloved brothers, become steadfast, unmovable, 
always having plenty to do in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in connection with the Lord. Some of our greatest joys, brothers, come from disciple-making. And as Paul said at 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20, For what is our hope, our joy, or crown of exultation? Why is it not, in fact, you, before our Lord Jesus, at his presence, you certainly are our glory and our joy? After Jehovah's divine victory is a reality and we've survived into that righteous new system, what a joy it's going to be to eternally live with those people that we've helped now gain the truth because we were motivated to give of ourselves night and day in making disciples. 